Um, so what have we been doing for the last few days to get ready for July 4th? Ready uh, to fire the whole system, ready to go, we're all ready to fire. Uh, we're sending the last commands, uh, commands are sent here on the ground. We'll continue to monitor everything is executing as we expect it to execute. It's on its own and it's designed to take care of itself along with all of the command sequences that we've sent it. What's going to happen on July 4th, the events are happening as designed. July 4th. So oh, um, I'm just so excited. To, we're about to arrive at Jupiter, um, and it's hard to believe. Uh, it's been a, I'm so proud to be part of this team. Learning about the recipe for how solar systems are made. We really, scientists don't really understand how the planets are made. We know after the sun formed, something happened and we formed Jupiter. It took up more than half of the material that was left over. We don't completely understand that and first step in that recipe, how do you make solar systems? Something happens that allows a star to be born and the first step eventually leads to us. Great progress on learning about that step, explain how our solar system formed and maybe how we got here, but NASA's discovering in other uh, star systems. And in order to, to accomplish uh, the science objectives of, that we're set out to do and the measurements that we want, we have a set of tools. Uh, we call them science instruments, tools that we use, uh, tricks of the trade, so to speak. I'll give you a little idea how those work. They're situated around the spacecraft. Everybody gets their turn to look at Jupiter. Vital organs, where the computer and the brains lie, all the sensitive electronics, kind of gets their turn as we spin through. So it was a very simple, efficient design some exciting new data. Well, we crossed that boundary about a week ago, and the science team spent some time arguing which day it was, because it wasn't, wasn't completely <laughs> clear. What you're going to see is something we call a spectrogram, which is a little bit complicated. It's from our waves instrument, so it's looking at plasma wave data. But we can hear, it's just like you hear music. So the human here can hear about 20 to 20,000 hertz, like, so we can convert those into audio, and we can actually listen to what it's like to, to leave the sun and enter Jupiter. And that's what you're going to hear. Can I have that animation? It's non-trivial to go into Jupiter. <laughs> Bow shock. It's the same kind of thing that you hear about if you're on a, you know, listening about a, how a supersonic jet works, right? It flies through the fluid or the air and makes a shock in front, a shock wave. Going through the ocean creates a bow, right? Shock, a wave in front of that. Plowing through the sun's domain and it's created this bow shock and we just crossed it. So we're there. We still got a lot to do on July 4th <laughs> and I'm still nervous, but... <laughs> We're in Jupiter's domain at this point. That was a big deal. So Juno does other kinds of science. I mean, besides the recipe and this, magnetos uh, this magnetosphere crossing, but a lot of what Juno is about is looking inside of Jupiter. What is in the interior? And we basically have scientific instruments that look inside the planet in every way we know how. And that's what you're going to hear in the next couple of talks, to look inside of Jupiter beneath those beautiful clouds, great red spot, and the zones and belts. And then eventually, how we explore the polar magnetosphere. Okay, and so for that first part, I'm gonna turn to Steve Levin, a good friend of ours. To Steve Levin, a good friend of ours. Hi, a microwave radiometer instrument. Single most important number that Juno's gonna bring back. How much water does Jupiter have? Crucial to understanding how the solar system formed be crucial to understanding how did Jupiter formed. If far from the sun, where it's cold, frozen water at that great distance, you'll get a different amount of water inside Jupiter than where it is now, or if it formed some other way than from starting with, with blocks of ice. So just by measuring that one number, we can learn a lot about how Jupiter formed, and that teaches us, teaches us not just about Jupiter, but about the whole solar system. Jupiter formed sort of out of the leftovers from the sun, and the rest of the planets formed out of the leftovers from Jupiter. We're gonna measure that with the microwave radiometer. But it's a radio receiver that uses the natural radio emission from Jupiter to look at six different channels that can see inside Jupiter and get the water, because they're going to get this key number. 
And the way we're going to do that is each different channel sees below the water cloud or up to the water cloud, sees deep into Jupiter's atmosphere. So we can take the measurements from the micro radiometer and use that to figure out how much water does Jupiter hold, which tells us about how did Jupiter form. We can do something like a CAT scan and get a three-dimensional picture of Jupiter's atmosphere. But to see these amazing features like the great red spot, a storm bigger than the whole Earth, or those belts and zones, jet streams moving at hundreds of miles an hour, in 3D with the radio receiver, instead of just that two-dimensional picture that you can see on the screen. More about how we can see inside Jupiter and go to greater depths. If we're going to understand uh, Jupiter's interior, we're going to have to look a lot deeper than we can look with the MWR. We measure the planet's gravitational field, and we measure its magnetic field. We measure just by looking at the orbit of Juno, as we measure with a pair of instruments out at the pointy end of the solar array. And these two, uh, two methods will probe the deep interior of the planet. Uh, oddly enough, Jupiter's interior is uh, quite a mystery to us. If we could roll the uh, animation. So uh, beneath the visible cloud tops that we see, there's a layer of molecular hydrogen. There's a, a core of metallic uh, conducting molecular hydrogen. The, the hydrogen atoms are pressed shoulder to shoulder so closely together that they're free to roam about the entire interior. That makes it a good electrical conductor. Beneath that layer, we think there may be a, a dense core of heavy elements, everything heavier than, than hydrogen and helium. We don't know that that core is there. It may be 10 Earth masses, 20 Earth masses. And if there is a core at the center of Jupiter, and if that core was possibly the seed, it made Jupiter the largest planet in our solar system. So uh, if I could have the next shot. This is a, a cross section. Uh, a wedge shape of uh, what we think the interior looks like. And you see that onion skin on top, that's the, with the magnetic field, we can penetrate deep below that surface. It may uh, be at the top of that metallic hydrogen region. We don't know for sure. It may be in the molecular uh, hydrogen region above. 20,000 times more powerful than the Earth's magnetic field. Jupiter uh, control over its own domain. That uh, takes Jupiter, in its science orbits, very close to the surface, no, it takes Juno, sorry, very close to the surface of Jupiter uh, in its 14-day orbits. It shows you Juno in its elliptical orbit. Uh, after a few orbits to set up this uh, mapping uh, plan, Juno traveling from north to south, from pole to pole, and that gives us a complete map, uh, completely encircling the planet into probe really for the first time was generated by a dynamo and what it looks like at the disk at Jupiter much more accurately and with much more resolution than we could ever do it in orbit about the Earth. And it's also because on Earth, when we try to image the dynamo, we have to look through a magnetized crust, nothing to obscure our view of dynamo action right down in the uh, interior of the planet where it's generated. Very, very exciting opportunity that we have uh, in exploration of Jupiter that we could never do uh, in orbit about the Earth. Uh, above the poles of Jupiter, unexplored region of Jupiter's magnetosphere, where I'm sure very uh, many discoveries await us. And so uh, to talk about those discoveries, I'm going to hand it off to my good friend and colleague, Fran Baganel, to talk about the aurora. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much, Jack. The sphere of influence, very strong magnetic field, vast, enormous, a wind of protons and electrons, a million miles an hour. We know that that wind is gusty, blowing and changing as the gust of the solar wind comes and goes. We have a very special opportunity uh, observing the variable um, solar wind. But let me talk a bit about the Jovian Aurora, if we could have the picture here. Blue, they look blue, but it's ultraviolet in fact. It doesn't vary very much, doesn't vary very much. There are very strong electrical currents, electrical currents, that are coupling these moons moved to the planet. And where the charged particles that are carrying those currents hit the atmosphere, uh, I'm going to show you an animo animation in a minute that was taken by Hubble uh, in the past few months. Is here in the room, Johnny Nichols from the University of Leicester. About 25 days, sorry, 25 uh, 
uh, days of observing many orbits of Hubble, looking at the aurora. So let's have this movie. I'm going to repeat it three times. Uh, this is a clip that is sped up about um, uh, 300 times at about 45 minutes, which swirls around and changes over time, uh, fueled by material, in fact, from that volcanic moon Io, looking at the aurora, looking at Jupiter at that. And so we'll get a measure of the variability of the solar wind upstream, the variability of the magnetosphere, as well as looking at the variability of the emissions um, from Earth. Let's have a look at the next uh, picture here. This shows you the size of what we're talking about. The auroral region is about five Earths across, a uh, hundred times the aurora that comes from auroral power that comes from Earth. Uh, it'll be telling us about the magnetosphere. We have the last of my pictures you'll see here. This unique situation with uh, Juno flying over the poles and so we'll be able to measure the acceleration processes that cause these auroral uh, effects. At the same time, we'll be measuring uh, plasma waves and uh, the perturbations in the magnetic field, radio waves that come that we've known for many decades. It's a very unique opportunity to be looking at this uh, very interesting phenomena, very bizarre um, glowing and flickering and so on associated with the aurora. Uh, but we've never been able to get up close and really observe these processes. Or do we have to really go back to the fundamental physics and work out what's really going on here? We're really looking forward to a very exciting opportunity to look at the aurora uh, in many different ways and different aspects. So I'll hand this back to Scott. Thanks, Fran. So I'll hand this back to Scott. Thanks, Fran. So uh, you can tell we're all really excited. The whole team is so thrilled. We're, we're really getting there, and we're so close to Jupiter. Um, we have a big event on July 4th, as you know, uh, really important to us. And um, we're about to jump on that, that Jupiter train. So we also have a camera. Um, that's called Juno Cam, and it's a public outreach camera, and we uh, make those images and even the data available uh, to the public through our websites. Can I get that um, picture? Some of the unique uh, or exciting ideas is that you're not only can you start to see the uh, the colors, you can actually see the red spot in this image. The footprints of those are in the aurora, so there's an umbilical cord through the magnetic field that's tying those moons into Jupiter sending particles back and forth, or they light up, and that's kind of cool. I hope you all join us. We're getting really close. Um, we're really excited. We want to invite everybody along for the ride. Come see us on July 4th. Thank you. Back to you, DC. Thank you, Scott.